We will not be down with communists, but we will organize our own independent civil society. And for example, there, there was a main uh, news, um, um, uh, in the main news for 7.30, where the propaganda, nasty, terrible, false propaganda, communist propaganda was 7.30 to 8. So what we did, we organized uh, family walks, exactly starting 7.30, every going out, everybody going out with children, socializing, clapping on the back, making jokes, and sharply, eight, everybody going back. <laughs> so this was a Rosa message, uh, which was not confrontational. They couldn't arrest everybody, but this was obvious that we are confronting, we are opposing this nasty news. So in the most extreme situations, you can always take it in your own hands. So as, as uh, you introduced me, uh, there is a, a practice hat on my head, there is the academic research and an author, and this is all complements each other because my, uh, my insights from practice go into my influence my research and my research influence my, my books and so on. And the book, the two books you mentioned are these ones, the one just uh, just appeared in Cambridge University Press and is highly recommended. Um, also I my job at Ashoka still is to travel around the world and make interviews with candidates, the social uh, entrepreneurs, social innovators, and actually these are the sources of my of uh, my knowledge about people taking responsibility in own hands in extreme situations, not only in Europe where you have uh, the European Union's funding, but also like here in Hungary, you have a situation of very poorly resourced uh, areas, very underfunded, uh, with a lot of poverty, some of them I think mostly uh, east, that's east of Hungary. And here you have someone not waiting for the resources, for the institutions, because they have no money, no ideas, and you're just launching real power foundation and working with children, family, building bridges, and actually promoting them to the mainstream and actually closing the gap. So uh, she took here in Hungary, with some responsibility in our hands. And meeting such people around the world, I had several insights. First of all, they bring new sustainable solutions based on community's potential, as she did. Actually, this was totally embedded in the community, not in the officer's desk in the office, having some top-down ideas which didn't work, but in the community's potential. They do, it with, with, do this with passion and commitment, which you won't find with, within the bureaucratic um, sector. And they require very small investments. This requires just space and paper and talking and being warm and being passionate. Uh, and also, they contribute with bottom-up initiatives. The bottom-up here is the key issue. So you have so many around Europe, people like Carlo Petrini, who I interviewed in Italy, who launched the idea of slow food, that, and the slow food manifesto is to have good quality food, green production, fair access, accessibility, fair production, and slow eat with the culture behind. That this is a culture event, enjoying the culture of slow food. Eh? He immediately, you know, bottom up, the idea spread like a disease to US, to Germany, to Hungary, uh, to Italy. You have uh, like uh, 80 countries, 90 countries with slow food, and people meeting, young people meeting, there is a slow food youth network, and Terra Madre, where everybody meets, and Ireland, and whatever. You have not only that. He launched the idea of um, agriculture and eco-consuming uh, eco and, and created the University of Gastronomic Sciences. 
So this is the first in the world the University of Gastronomic Sciences. Everything but their mouth. It wasn't anybody from the ministry saying, let's do this. It was a single guy who got the idea, started it small on the stairs of Roma, in the Spanish stair stairs, uh, when he, they opposed the McDonald's coming to, to Rome, the first McDonald's, and then they got the idea. And he spread, so he changed the, he changed actually the world uh, through the slow food map. Um, I'll give you an example, another example, which is stunning to me, shocking. I landed in Burkina Faso, which is just desert. Also, Ouagadougou, the capital, is just desert with some parts. It's absolutely poverty, a desert and dirty stones. And now the question is, and, and nobody can cope with it. I mean, the governmental programs didn't work. They failed. Everything was uh, vandalized, or whatever they did didn't work. One single man, see, uh, sculpture, Syriki was just um, ha having with his sculpture tools and um, walking around the city and then fall asleep, woke up with his head on the stone and the first thing the sculptor does, curse the stone. And he started carving the stone. And inside the nature, not taken to the museum, he, this, he actually scurred as a wonderful sculpture. Then he called his colleagues, each of them took another stone, the, the surplus of stones, and sculptured more and more. And then you have thousands of square meters, a huge territory with people, sculptors coming from around the world, each of them taking a stone, and then they could be dancing and drinking. Dancing is very important because this is also a, a, a generated by a lot of joy and fun. So here you have some native African, very African, but people now come, the best ones from all around the world. The artists who you can see in Louvre and other museums, it's all in the desert, it's all in the nature, it's not taken away, and it grows. You, it took me three hours, and you have to do it five o'clock in the morning because of the heat, to see, and see that one, that one, that one. And what happened? It was, it's so attractive that buses with tourists are coming and giving money and paying for food and renting apartments. So a huge business grows around it. And people actually make money. Um, and again, the government comes after and says, OK, we'll build a fence, we'll build an office, we'll charge for the tickets, and we'll take money. So the government is second. First is an initi initiative of a single man, someone with passion and commitment. He actually contributed to the economic development of the, of the region. And as I said before, at the beginning, it was this dirty stones which were the resources. He didn't need much funding. He needed only his friends and, and fun. Uh, so, um, uh, similar in Poland, there are post communist communities, Kochos, which uh, very, suffered very much with backwards and, and addiction and dependency on the governmental funding. And here is one of them. They were drinking vodka in the evening, being completely despaired, and saying, one of them said, maybe we should change it to hobbits, like with irony. And they said, yes! And they turned the village into a hobbiton. Like, uh, see? Here, here, here. And again, buses with children are coming day and night, paying a lot of money. And they are very well off. Now they make a hell of money, they can invest and develop. Again, a bottom up idea. Would an officer in the office or the governmental person come up with the idea to change a village into a hobbiton? Never. So again, the session shouldn't be seen, and the children are having fun, and everybody in the village changes clothes, and there was one guy who didn't want, uh, who was a bump. 
So they give him a, a bottle and he's changed and then he sits in the center of the village and never wants to take this away and do some washing. He loves so much this outfit. So they make money out of nothing. Very small investment story, risque. So my uh, conclusion, I think that, was that the new leadership is just having creative ideas which fit to local con context. They are not parachuted from sometimes, from somewhere from above. And they are addressing real needs. And they are easy modifiable to the change in context. Very low investments and a very big impact. Um, and this is scalable, like <coughs> slow foot. Slow foot is everywhere in the world currently. Uh, okay, so now I, I just I have chosen, out of the hundreds or more interviews, I have chosen some which are in extreme conditions to show you that we are here in Europe very much privileged with all this funding around. It's Bangladesh, one of the poorest countries in the world. But you know, we have very good spirit. And there was the post-British, uh, post-colonial um, authoritarian education with no questions asked and a very low level of mathematics. And this was for decades. Nobody wanted to change it. The government tried, organized um, <coughs> conferences. The teachers wanted to come to have coffees and co cookies. But when back, everything reverted to the original state because nobody needed kids to do more mathematics than counting in the shop how much in return coins he should get. So on the other hand, again, here is the system, and here is a very young lad. At that time, he was a student of the university, loving mathematics, having a dream that his beloved Bangladesh will blossom with mathematics. And, and could he do it? One guy against the whole system with the traditional methods like governmental politics, <coughs> inducing teachers, persuading parents, all that didn't work because there was an equilibrium. The system actually got a sort of an equilibrium around low level mathematics. Everybody was happy. So he understood that something must be different, somehow different. And he was driven by dream, by passion, by creativity, and entrepreneurship. Uh, no government intervention. Just a few schools in a, in a small community as a pilot project. He understood that he shouldn't talk about Olympiads because everybody is very much scared. His dream was to bring the Bangladeshi team to the international Olymp mathematical Olympiads movement. But he will talk about festivals, about bonfire, singing, dancing. See, these are one of the first photos ever with uh, children and school students having fun. Before it was so dreadful, dull, and sitting just listening. And the festival was very well taken because it attracted media, it attracted business from around, and um, school superintendents and so on. The second one was there must be questions and answers. You can't teach better mathematics without students asking questions. So he motivated the teachers to answer the next day after the bonfire and singing. There was the question and answers and session, and you see the first time in the Bangladeshi history, children asking questions and the teachers answering. You know why they were motivated to do it? Because they were videotaped, they were on TV, and the uh, school authorities watching, business people watching. So it was grim and fine, they said they answered the questions, and this opened the door for the dialogue. Because then it started. So the, the, this attractor, journalist, and so on, it was a huge, colorful uh, issue on the TV and in the papers, and started to spread like a snowball. Because other schools also wanted the business people to donate the school, seeing all that on TV, and also wanted the 
let's call superintendents uh, watching that. Then the third step was the publication. There was no publication whatsoever because there was no demand, no market demand. And uh, our hero, Munir, um, started a small insert in the newspapers, like a funny, regular funny question. And it, why the festival spread, it blew, blew, blew up, and when I was there it was a separate insert with separate, like hundreds of uh, mathematical riddles and everybody wanted to have it. Um, then the Olympiad, these are the first students in the Bangladeshi history of the Olympiad, and in 2008 they got accepted to the International Olympiad Movement, in 2009 they were the second place in the Balkans and see how they were accepted after those riddles in the newspaper, after all those coverage in the TV. People are enthusiastic for mathematics and for their team being in the international movement. Munir also launched the C Students Association and Teachers Association so they, they did it on their own as uh, teachers watch to care for the high standards and so on. This contributed to the change the educational system, more dialogue, more questions. Other uh, biology also wanted to have it because it was so beneficial and so on. So more mathematical uh, alumni, more economic development. Okay, the system, big system, government face with everything, there is one small the young guy to bring on fashion and he changes the system. So he, we call him a social entrepreneur. Social entrepreneur in one. And this, uh, I was there because I am also representative of this actual kind of for the public. This is an international uh, association of leading social entrepreneurs and innovators. And we have Mohammed Yonos with us. Uh, who is a Nobel Prize winner, another Nobel, Nobel Prize winner, Kaila Shatiarki. Uh, and this is an organization for people like Munir, who actually now to very low cost, some wonderful ideas to change the city. This is Russia globally, and a lot of them here in Hungary, also in uh, other Central European countries, and in Europe. So, then I was, as, a, as a technician, I was thinking, what is the difference? Why are they so successful? I understood that they are not addressing the problem, pushing the ball up, the metaphor of the problem is the ball, not pushing it up, because it will fall down very quickly after they are gone. For instance, with the conference for teacher, where the conference is over, the ball falls down because there is no force keeping it up. Better to shape the ambience, to shape the environment. So they are sort of shaping the environment, creating a, a supportive environment for change instead of pushing change directly. And let me give you an example of a conflict which is actually insurmountable and tractable, and nobody knows how to solve it. Um, why doesn't it fit? Nevertheless. Uh, usually this metaphor is that we are pushing the ball up and, and as long as the, uh, as the force keeps the ball, it's up. But then, when the force is gone, the ball falls back again. You know how to fix it? Uh. So um, there were tries, like for instance, uh, mixed schools for Arabs and Israeli children discussing uh, conflict issues. Immediately they got into heated discussion, the parents intervened, everybody has started to hate each other, the school collapsed. So there were trials, top-down experts, conflict resolution, earning a lot of money, going back happy, that they did a good work, but then after they were back, the ball fell down. So the top-down solutions don't work. And here is another Ashoka fellow from our interview, unfortunately he passed away, Dr. Yehuda Bas, 
Hosseini was that he is not allowing to speak about the conflict issues, but he's launching joint uh, Arab and Israeli businesses led by females, by women. And a lot of fun, a lot of play, but only business matters. And a lot of businesses were incubated. The women there make a lot of money. They contributed with financially to their family. Their position were over highly. And also, they started to like each other. Indirectly, not through pushing the, why don't you like, she's a nice woman. No, it's because they, they did all this work together. They were successful. They understood that during cooperation that the other person is, these are the friendships. And these are the two leaders, an Arab and Israeli leader. And this organization, is the, they have, it has two co-directors. And they are iconic in the Middle East currently. And those, those small businesses actually change totally because they are benefiting from peace. They don't want anymore to have the conflict because they benefit from these. They please give them money. And there is a theory, Bartow's theory, a professor, who says that very often uh, the narratives and things which are around that supports, uh, that creates, we call it the negative attractor. That attracts the bomb, that people are having those narratives, lifestyle, they miss money out of the conflict. When the conflict is done, gone, they don't know how to actually find themselves in the new world. So, so they revert to conflict. Not because of the conflict per se, but because of the environment which supports the conflict. So the solution, by, uh, our hero's solution, was Yehuda Pass was to build an alternative attractor here, which is cooperation with businesses, female, especially women are wonderful in cooperation and they are very empathetic and so on. And the new attractor actually, um, the conflict one just faded away automatically. So they built alternative attractor. They find how to circumvent the conflict. They involve a lot of creativity, bottom up initiatives, and joy. Joy is extremely important because you, you don't have much joy in the governmental offices, don't you? So this is the place where people dance and are happy. Also, Einstein said that creativity is intelligence having fun. So you can't be creative and very serious, thinking how to solve the problem. The only way is just to have fun. And there are many books around creativity and fun. I will not take your time on that, but that's actually my hobby because I'm also interested in neuroscience. I wrote some articles on the neuroscience and creativity and how much joy activates creativity, but this is a separate issue. The interesting thing for us is that this is not only the social sector, but also business. There are so many businesses now with joy. This is an example, and then it's back it, where Richard's friend was driving the car and saying, listen, maybe we'll start a, a business. Okay, what business? A business where everybody has fun. Are you crazy? Everybody could have fun because it's for money, not for fun. And what they did, according to James Bucket, they launched this business and, and uh, the business AAES, which is the, one of the Fortune 200 company, an energy giant with, with 40,000 employees and 8.6 billion uh, revenue currently. And the, the real focus there, uh, the bottom focus, is, is on joy. We have to have fun. And he wrote a book, very much welcome, Joy at Work, which shows that Joy at Work actually augments creativity and, and generates much more revenue than the series. And another morning star processing tomato. They are having no, no bosses, no structure. Everybody's responsible on their own work. And they will build a business which is, uh, takes 40% of tomato processing in the United States, um, 700 million annual revenue, and so on. But this is all completely self-driven, self-organized. 
and the people there are reporting, I interviewed people there, they are saying that over the weekend they are missing the work because they, they go on to, they're missing Monday, they want Monday to come as quick as possible because they again and play, they call it tomato game. So workplace is a game. Same with Gartex, you know Gartex, everybody knows Gartex. Gartex is totally the, a bottom-up manage with no managers, no structure. Same with Semco Partners, which the, uh, this is a fantastic guy, Ricardo Semler, a long story in the book I have showed you, you can read about it. And they are launching a Leadwise Academy and teaching others how to, how to make it totally unstructured, bottom-up, in a sort of chaotic way. So the, the modern business, the modern social structures, is not about better structuring, drawing those boxes with arrows, who depends, who is first, who second, who third. That doesn't bring any creativity, that doesn't bring you any further. It's just pure rest. The modern business and the modern social sector is about allowing others to interact freely between each other and from this interaction to come up with some ideas we call it an emer uh, emergent phenomenon, the process of emergence. But this means chaos. You are uh, accepting chaos in a way. In, in what? So how to harness chaos into order? Do you know that everybody has a visa card? Yes, here. So the visa uh, founding CEO, Dean Hawk, wrote a book, Birth of the Chaotic Age. Chaotic chaos, order. Merging chaos and order. And he said that actually the success of Visa International is because of this merge of chaos, harness and chaos. As I want to show you this small presentation here. Then comes the perturbation, milk. Every individual starts pushing in one direction. <laughs> and this is what happens. They find their way The being with them is an emergent property to of the interactions be between others. They is to try and keep So it's best when you... Oh my goodness, what happens? <laughs> when you no. Then comes the perturbation. Um, Actually, I, I know how to manage a laptop, but not such a big <laughs> Then comes the perturbation. <laughs> Every individual starts pushing in one direction. And this is what happens. Okay. So, um, I don't know how to come back to the slides. But, uh, what, But what I wanted to say is that the, we are in the vortex of change, the world. That was what was said. One of the things which is the challenge is that we need to know how to accept and harness chaos. Chaos in what, of course, because not all chaos, chaos becomes constructive. Some of it is destructive. So we, we need to know. We need to uh, be savvy in making a, in a a chaotic interaction. Uh, so um, I'll give you one last example. And uh, but this is extremely important because it shows that when it, I have m many more slides, I'll show it on during the course in October about dogs and other creatures and people. How from chaos they and find a new order by themselves, not being directed or managed by anybody. And this is the challenge for the future, to breed leaders who are not afraid of chaotic interactions, when I mean people interacting around them and coming up with ideas and knowing how to turn chaos into order, the order. In our, uh, one last example, I mean, if I or not, oh, we don't have time. Okay. One last example is that the 
prevailing problem all around the world is bullying and aggression in schools. And um, nobody can cope it. And they, they, it was also done bottom top down, like you are putting some guards in the school on cameras or checkpoints. It failed. So here comes the passion of the American mm -hmm. And a kindergarten teacher who says that we have to do something about it. The government's fake, the bureaucracy fake, top down fakes. I have to think because, yes, that's you, my goodness, this is empathy. We need to bring empathy to school. But how to bring empathy? How to teach empathy? Nobody knows. She got the idea. She brought mothers from the neighborhood with babies, and there are classes preparing uh, for uh, the, the students meeting the baby, and they encourage to meet the baby, play with it, ask questions, uh, ask questions, and there is a special instructor, and what happens is that after such a semester, the aggression and bullying is totally gone. Uh, see some of it here. That, I, I've visited several classes like that. Yes. See how it is. <laughs> Interacting with the baby makes the students, and she was very proud, a very problem uh, student. And after that, she changed something. There was the University of Toronto doing um, longitudinal studies several years after what happens compared to kids which, who didn't go through this program, which is called Rules of Family. And those kids which went through this program actually are much better off, more cooperative, less aggressive, and no bullying, and so on. And, um, and later, later on, probably, this is my hunch as a psychologist, they will, there will be less dropouts and less uh, delinquency and less dependency. Uh, and this was so convincing that it spread throughout all Canada, in all provinces, currently in Britain, in the island, in Japan, in Switzerland, very strong program in Switzerland. So, um, first of all, Let's invite Jody to <coughs> the university at some point because she is an icon, a role model, spread from one class, from one school throughout the world. Nobody could cope with aggression, and this young adult child <coughs> from a um, kindergarten teacher found the solution. So this is my conclusion. Done. Pay some, uh, give so much down to governments, to the structures, to the policies. It doesn't matter so much. If you take it in your own hands, if you have your own mission, initiative, if you do it, it's in, in places like conflict zones or solidarity tanks on the street, as I said, or Bangladesh, where they have no resources at all. We always can change the world. So that's why I am not so much involved in politics and <laughs> political sciences because I don't believe in that. I believe in people in your power. Thank you. Thank you.